Okay, so with that said, we're going to welcome our next speaker here. This is Samir Ajmani uh, from Google. And his fun fact is actually quite fun. Um, so he works at Google. This is important to the story. And uh, one time, while load testing a proxy he was building, he DOS Google.com. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Yeah, I got a, an interesting email from the dial service team who subsequently asked me to include an explicit user, user agent so they knew it was me next time. <laughs> All right, so yes, I uh, work at Google. I've been at Google a little over 11 years. Uh, I have been a tech lead manager on the Go team for the past several years. And um, my job when I joined the Go team was to take, it was basically right around when Go 1.0 came out, to take the language and make it actually useful to production users inside Google. Uh, and some of you might know, you know, my, what I really enjoy about Go is the concurrency model and the various things you can do with it. You know, despite the, the trend that we've had, which is, you know, don't overuse channels and Go routines. I, you know, I really love them. And, this, you know, this talk will be, you know, more in that theme if you've seen my previous talks. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about gRPC, which is a new open source RPC libra library from Google. And it is, in fact, an open source version of the internal RPC system we use at Google called Stubby. And my team, the Go team, worked very closely with the Stubby team on the design and implementation, particularly of the API they're using, because we had very strong opinions about what a good you know, API would be. And I think it really makes a difference to how you use uh, an RPC system in Go. Um, I'm going to make some, what I think are some interesting claims about RPC and Go, and uh, we'll see if we can move somebody. All right. So RPC isn't just remote procedure calls. Call. In school, many of us learn, you know, well, RPC is sort of a way of, you, you call a procedure and then Marshall stuff sends it over the wire to execute somewhere and comes back. And that was just kind of the model. Um, I want you to think about it a little bit differently. In Go, an RPC starts a Go routine running on the server. And it provides a message passing between the client Go routine and the server Go routine. All right? And now, what we traditionally think of as RPC is what I'm going to call here unary RPC, which means a single request to the server and the server sends a single response. But in fact, there's a generalization here, which is streaming RPC, which is the client server may each send multiple messages. Um, and RP, in, in this generalization, RPC ends when both sides are done sending messages, and that's sort of a normal completion, or either side disconnects, or the RPC is canceled or timed out. And this um, gets back to the notion that there may be some broader context in which an RPC is executing some upstream request or some user interaction that governs whether it should continue. So what I'll show you in this talk is how we connect RPCs and streaming RPCs with Go routines and channels and Go programs in general. Uh, this is going to be a very code-heavy talk. Uh, it's going to be tight on time, so we're going to go a little pretty fast. Um, so you and RPC, one request, one response. Uh, an example might be a mobile, apps app, uh, mobile maps app on your phone. Request a route from point A to point B. This is clearly something you cannot or don't want to compute locally. You send it to the server, and the server does possibly a large distributed computation to get your result quickly. On the client side in Go, an RPC is going to block. Right? It's a synchronous call. It's going to block until it either completes, and it may complete successfully with an error, or it's canceled. Uh, and then, so if the client wants to run multi multiple RPCs simultaneously, you use multiple Go routines. And again, an RPC is an exchange between a client Go routine and a server Go routine. In streaming RPC, we have bidirectional message passing. This should sound a little familiar. Bidirectional message passing between Go routines. Uh, so a client starts a stream with a server. Messages sent on a stream are delivered FIFO. Um, and you can, again, you can, the client can have many Go routines mul running multiple streams with the same server, right? So you can have, or with, and uh, as well as with other servers. Um, and so the transport then is going to provide buffering and flow control. Uh, when, on, if you have a single over each given connection. So some examples here, a truly bidirectional stream might be something like a chat session, um, maybe an instant messaging application. Uh, you can have also unidirectional streams. For example, a stream from the server to clients might be something like a stock ticker. And in the other direction, you might imagine some sort of aggregation system, like a sensor aggregation. So gRPC is a new RPC system from Google. It's a gRPC.io is the home page and has uh, links to everything you need. It provides both RPC and streaming RPC, and it's available in 10 languages. Um, the native implementations are in C, Java, and Go. That's C without the plus plus, right? Uh, all of the other languages for it are wrappers in the C implementation, but Java and Go have native implementations. 
Um, what that means is that if you pick up gRPC, you're not locking yourself into Go, right? You're, it's meant for interoperation among all kinds of programs. The interface definition language is Proto3. This is a new version of Go's protocol buffers that provide some important simplifications that actually make it work really, really nicely with Go. I'll show you some of the generated code in a little bit. And the transport is HTTP2, which is a new version of HTTP that provides bidirectional streaming, you know, long with connections, a variety of other nice things. And it provides the framing needed for the, by the RPC protocol. I'm going to make heavy use of two other packages in the net sub-repository. Context, which I talked about last year at this conference, uh, and that's going to provide deadlines, cancellation, request code values uh, that are going to propagate across RPC connections. And then a new package called net trace, and this is going to provide real-time request traces and connection logging, and I'll give that in a demo. So gRPC already has a fair number of users. It was released early this year and very recently in the last couple of weeks on beta. Um, we have 150 imports on godoc.org. Um, here's a list of some of the users. Uh, I'm just going to read what they're using it for. A container OS, a distributed file system, uh, distributed key value store, sparse table storage, transaction platform, data analytics, and MySQL storage scaling. Systems, real systems that need to scale, that need to run efficiently. Um, I'm going to call out Google Cloud Bigtable just because a lot of the Google Cloud APIs are going to lean heavily on gRPC as well. So you expect, should expect to see a lot more of this. So the rest of the talk is code and demos. Uh, my example here is Google Search, a very simplified version of Google Search. And um, well, let me get into it. So here's a protocol definition. This is a Proto3 uh, file. We define a service, that's our RPC service, called Google. And right now we're going to start with just one RPC search that takes a request and returns a result. The request is a message, and it has one field, which is the query, and it's of type string. And the result has three, a title, a URL stem, but also strings. Uh, Proto is more general than this. You could have map fields. You can have slice fields, repeated fields. Um, the numbers after the fields here are the tag identifiers used for the protocol encoding. The generated code, you're going to use the protocol compiler, Proto C at the top here, and it's going to uh, produce uh, search.pb.go output file, and it's going to give us all the stub code for um, uh, both the client and service side. On the client side, we have an interface. Uh, it's the name generated corresponds to the name of the service. So here we have Google Client, and it has one method search, which takes a context, and again, that's going to give us our, our cancellation request scope information. The request, uh, star request, and some number of options for that call. And it's going to return a result and an error. Google Server is, going to have, is an interface that we're going to implement, and that's going to have the same uh, parameters. So it's mirrored on both sides. Um, the request struct is going to have that query. It's a string. And notice the struct is entirely flat. There's no indirection here. There's no pointer. So this is something about Proto3, is you, we get flat structs for our messages, which is really nice. Uh, and the result, again, is flat, three fields, title, URL, and snippet, all strings. And there's a JSON encoding here built in. So this, you can mirror this over to JSON quite easily. All right, so the example system we're going to use has uh, three kinds of components, a command line client, a front end, and two back ends. And so the front end is going to act both as a uh, server for the command line client as well as the client of the back ends. So the way search is going to work is when the, cli the client will make a request to the front end, and it is going to send that request simultaneously to two back ends, and it's going to deliver the first reply to the client. Some of you might be remembering this. This was the example that Rob Pike used in Go Concurrency Patterns. What I'm showing you here is an actual implementation of that that does a few additional things like cancellation and actually works. Um, so the client, <laughs> well, that one worked too, but that was all local in process. This is now a distributed version, right? So the client is going to send the query to the front end. The front end here is going to send it simultaneously to both back ends. The back ends are just going to sleep for random delay and return a reply that indicates which one replied. So all the data, you know, everything is still a fake implementation here, but the networking is real. Um, when the front end returns its reply to the client, that will also trigger the context there to be canceled, and that's going to cause the second back end, uh, the slower back end, to get its RPC canceled. So let's see how that all works. Let's go to the demo. Got a result. Okay, so we're going to bang on this a few more times, and you'll see that sometimes we get uh, back end zero, and sometimes we get back end one. Again, it's random. This wasn't terribly exciting because it just kind of worked, right? Um, so the question is, what's going on? Well, this is where the request traces come on. So the net 
the net trace package is going to give us a way to instrument our code to provide real-time tracing. And the GR and GRBC provides us out of the box. So the net trace package is going to export a couple of HTTP uh, pages for us. The first one's on debug request. So if I reload this, we'll see. Uh, is this readable? I can make this larger. That's good. Um, we see that there's uh, two request families on the left-hand side. GRPC, because it's a package to define it, and then set and receive for the Google service. So the stuff in the receive bucket is on the server. This is the front end we're looking at. So it's the stuff that the front end received. So it's uh, the RPC that served. And the sent bucket is the stuff that uh, it has sent outbound. So if you have a pure client, it'll just have sent stuff. If you have a pure server, it'll just have received. Now, if we, these numbers over here are latency buckets. So this is a way of seeing uh, very quickly getting an index of what is, has been fast or slow. So if we click here, we're going to see that there's been a number of Google search RPCs at this front end, received again. And they took uh, elapsed times um, in, uh, what is this, 40-something uh, milliseconds, so not terribly fast. Um, and the reason there is because the back end is doing a random sleep between 0 and 100 milliseconds. Um, if we click over to the right, we can get a quick latency histogram. And this latency histogram will be complete uh, over the lifetime process or the last hour or the last minute. Um, obviously, nothing's happened in the last minute. Um, and so this is a quick way of getting a snapshot of what's going on in your server and where, where you might be seeing some slowness. Um, and you can see the subset that we're very slow. Now, why are some slower? Well, because we're taking the first response from whichever backend was faster, right? So in some case, if both backends are rolling that 100 millisecond die, uh, you're going to get some that are over 50 milliseconds. That's this one right here. Now, there's more information in these traces than just the title. If I expand this, now I'm going to get information on uh, where I received the RPC, which is a command line client, the deadline that was coming, the request, the um, actual request pro and the response. And uh, this OK shows me how long it took that server uh, handler to, to actually run. Now, on the set side, so we can see here that here's one that uh, responded from backend one, and here's one that was from backend zero. On the send side, we get the same sort of information, but now we're seeing the RPCs at the front end sent to the two backends. And now here we can see that we sent one to backend one, and then immediately or thereafter, we canceled the other one. So when we got the first response, we returned that to the client, and then the context for the RPC was canceled, and that automatically canceled the second backend. So I'll show you that in the code in a moment. We get the same sort of thing on our backends as well. So on the backends, they're, serv they're only servers, so they only have the receive. Now, that tells us part of the story. That tells us what's going on with the actual request. But there's more going on here. So what happens if I go in and kill one of these backends? Oh, the font is tiny. The front end is going to start spamming log errors saying, you know, I'm trying to reconnect here. But you might not be looking at the log. Um, we want a way to be able to tell that this is going on again, on a live server. So a second element of the trace package is what we call event logs. And so we are going to have, what this is a similar sort of organization, but this is for long-lived objects in your system. You can associate an event log with your object, and then it will give you, uh, and you choose the, the name here of the family as well as the title. So this, the client connection, each connection on your, on your uh, gRPC system is going to have its own event log. And if you expand this, we'll see, um, that we've bucketed this by the, how long it's been since the last error, which is sort of handy for saying, well, when, did, when were things going wrong? And we can see that one of them is fine. It came up, and it immediately got connected. And you get a nice allocation stack here, so you can tell where this, uh, uh, this connection was allocated in your program. But the other one is showing us uh, that it's having difficulty connecting. It was up for a while, uh, 1,900 seconds. And now it's uh, with an exponential back off trying to reconnect. And so if we reload here, it's just going to keep on uh, trying to do that. And when we bring, if we bring the back end back up, we will still see a reconnect, though maybe a little while. So I'll just keep moving with this, and we'll see that in a bit. OK, so let's see how this all works. My slides are over here. So we're going to look at the code, uh, the client code, the back end code, and the front end code. So we'll start with the client. So we're going to import that generated protocol uh, code I showed you earlier uh, as PB, just to give it a nice short name. And here's our main function in our command line client. Uh, the first thing we have to do is dial our server. This is a front end server. Um, 
That's going to hit us a uh, connection. And then we're going to wrap it in our generated stub. So pb.new Google client gives us a wrapper that we can then call methods on. Um, our client has two modes, search and watch. I'll show you watch in a little bit. So the search function is going to take our client and our query. And first thing it's going to do is it's going to create a context with a timeout. Here I'm using an 80 millisecond timeout. So there's some probability that uh, when I ran that command line client in search mode, it was going to time out. But we've got lucky and all, the sooner of our two requests was always under 80 milliseconds. Um, we are going to create our query request uh, by just using a struct literal syntax. So you saw the generated code for our messages is just go structs. It's very easy to set this up um, using struct literals. Uh, Client.search blocks. You give it the context, you give it the request, it blocks, gives you the result. Then we're just going to print that. And you, know, you saw the string format of the protocol buffer in the trace. So RPCs are going to block, but you can cancel them using context. Um, and gRPC is going to propagate that cancellation, automa cancellation automatically from client to server. And furthermore, from that server to back end servers, as long as you plumb that context through. So let's look at the back end code now. The back end, first thing it has to do is listen on a TCP port. So you know, we have those two back ends, so I'm just offsetting the port by an index. And then you're going to create a new gRPC server. You're going to register an implementation of the Google service, and then you're going to listen. And you're going to serve on that, uh, that listener. Now, a new server here is just uh, a new instance of the unexported type server, and that's going to implement this Google server interface. It's going to have a method for search and watch again, which I was supposed to do later, but you'll see. Um, and again, each call to search or watch is going to run in, in its own government team. So let's see the implementation. Um, this is server.search, so it's the implementation of our search RBC. Uh, first, we're going to choose a random duration to sleep on. And then we're going to log that sleep using the context. So I forgot to show you this earlier, so let's take a look at what I mean there. If we look at the backend traces, we expand these, you can see that in addition to logging that it received a query, and uh, then it got canceled. It says sleeping for 100 milliseconds. What's happening here is that our own application code, our server code, can annotate this trace. And that is, again, coming in through the context. So here's the code for log sleep. It's going to say, give me the trace from the context. And if I get it, if this is indeed being traced, then I'm going to uh, arrange for this printf to happen it, when the trace is viewed. That's why it's a lazy printf. We're not, we don't want to spend the time formatting it unless someone actually goes and requests the string. Um, and the reason that this is conditional here is that we may not want to, we may want to turn tracing off, or we may want to do some sort of sampling. So this gives us control over that. All right, so we choose a random duration, we log the sleep, then we're going to block until either that duration elapses, in which case we send the result, or until the RPC is canceled, in which case we return immediately. All right, so this allows us to be very responsive. Uh, and again, we're composing the result again just using a struct literal. The title is just going to identify the query and the backend that we were turning. So now let's look at the front end. The front end has to do now this glue code simultaneously act as both a server to the command line client and a client at the two back ends. So search returns as soon as it gets the first result, and gRPC is going to automatically cancel any remaining back end via the context. So again, front end is going to implement that same interface, right? The, the Google server interface with the search method. It takes a context, a request, returns a result, and an error. Um, we're going to create a channel of this little type result we define inside, uh, just within our server, uh, and that just has either result or an error, right? Because we could get either one from a back end. So we're going to have a channel of little result. For each back end, we'll start a go routine uh, for that back end and call search on that back end. And this is just, again, the same sort of client code we saw earlier. That's going to block. We're going to send a result on the channel. We'll get the first result from the channel and return. As soon as we return, gRBZ is going to say, the server handler is done, cancel the context. The context is going to cancel, it's going to hit whatever backends are still running are going to be informed that there's nothing more to do, stop your work, and the framework will then take care of canceling the remote service. It just tears down. Very simple code, very sophisticated behavior. All right, so that was search. I'm going to go on the streaming RPC. So let's add watch to the service. Watch is uh, a Similar idea, but instead of returning a single result, it's going to return a stream of results. So this is a unidirectional stream from the server to the client. And the only difference in the signature here is we said stream result instead of result. The generated code, well, we add the watch method. And looking at next to search, you see, well, it takes a request, it takes the options, 
but instead of returning a result, it returns this additional generated, this new generated type called Google Watch Client. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. On the server side, it's similar except for the parameter here is Google Watch Server, right? So this is the either end of that stream. On the client side, because this is unidirectional from server to client, Watch Client has a receive method that returns results. On the server side, it has a send method that sends results. These are fairly simple APIs, right? Receive returns a result or an error, send sends a result and, uh, and blocks and then returns an error. So we worked very hard with the stubby team to make sure these APIs are simple, clean, idiomatic, and yet you know, can support the behaviors we need. So here is what we're going to do with watch. Where search returns just the first result from each back, either backend and abandon the last one, with watch we're going to merge the results from the two backends in, uh, as we go. So the back ends, each time they're going to sleep for a random delay and send a result, and sleep for another random delay, send, send a result. Uh, and therefore, and then the front end is going to merge that stream of results. So here we can see that we got two, from back, two results from back end one in succession, and we're just going to stream those along. Then when we kill the client, control C in the command line, that will tear down the transport, and we'll, it'll automatically tear everything else down. All right, back to the demos. All right, so we got our stream running. Uh, you can see it's counting up for each back end. Um, you know, we're getting different results from different back ends. Let's go see what's going on in our traces. So now we have some RPCs in this active bucket. Right? So now we're looking at the front end. So the active RPC is that stream, <coughs> stream to the client. And if I reload here, you can see that we get, uh, we have the first few lines of the trace. We have elapsed time for the trace. We have the interval times uh, for the elements in the trace. Uh, and we have this middle thing that says 74 events discarded. Traces have a bounded amount they're allowed to take up in your memory. This is what protects your server against getting overwhelmed with trace data in memory. This is, none of this stuff is persistent. This is all instantaneous sort of in-memory stuff. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, you don't get overwhelmed. This is meant to just give you insight into what your server is doing. Uh, it's very useful when you're debugging stuff. We've been using this sort of thing inside Google for many, many years. Um, the active traces on the sent side, so this is again the front end's uh, calls to its back end, to the two back ends, you can see there's a stream from back end one and a stream from back end zero. So again, the ones we're delivering to client are the merge stream. So let's look at the back ends. Here's the active stream from back end zero, and here we get these nice sleeping for uh, 100 millisecond, 900 millisecond log messages from our handler, from our application code. Similarly for the other one. Uh, in our vent logs, just to come back to these, we can see that now the last error that we saw when I back when I restarted the back end was you know in the last 10 minutes, but not in the last one minute. And uh, we can expand this and see that it did in fact reconnect to that back end. So this is a nice way to then see what else is going on in your system. All right. So if I go and control C my client and I reload, well now I have no active RPCs. Um, that are, we let that watch go for a lot longer, so we have, we can find that over in this greater than 100 millisecond bucket. We can find those RPCs. They're also gonna sit in this errors bucket because uh, you know, there was an error on the, on the connection. So for these different buckets just give you a quick way to reference different kinds of uh, badness going on with your RPC system. But an important note is this net trace stuff is not RPC specific. It is a separate package that you can integrate any place you want this sort of uh, online tracing. So request traces are for stuff where you care about latency. Event logs are for longer lived stuff where you care about time since the last error. Um, well, so here we can see that the, the connection to the, from the client was torn down because the transport failed. And the connection to these two guys just got canceled to the two back ends. All right, back to the slides. So again, let's look at watch. We're going to look at the client, the back end, and then the front end in the middle. So the client code uh, for watch starts off very similar. We're going to create the query. We're going to start, we're going to call client.watch. And instead of getting a result back, we'll get this stream. And that's that Google uh, stream client uh, object. And it has a receive method. So we're going to have a loop, and we're going to call stream.receive, and that's going to block um, until it can give us a result or an error. Streams can return a special error value, which is io.eof, that indicates that the server 
close their end to indicate explicitly, you know, I'm not going to send anything more. Again, this should sound familiar from, you know, by analogy to channels. Um, otherwise, the stream can return other errors to indicate failure, and on success, we're just going to print the result on the client side. On the back end code, so here are, we're implementing the watch method. We get a request, and we get the stream handle on the server side. Um, that's going to have that send method. We need to send stuff to the client. Um, we're going we're gonna to loop, choose a new random duration on each iteration, log it to the trace, and then select, wait for either that duration to elapse or the stream to be canceled. Uh, if the sleep ends, then we're going to go ahead and send uh, the next result and loop around. So now the front end code. This is where it all comes together. So here, watch, we're going to create a channel of results again. But here we don't know how many results we're going to get. Right? There's, there's a long, long uh, stream of results, unbounded stream of results coming. For each backend, we're going to start a go routine. And it's going to call this watch backend helper. I'll show you in a moment. And that's going to run that watch stream on the specified backend with the query and send the results on this channel. Then we're going to start one more go routine to wait until all the backend watches are done and then close the channel. For those of you who read the pipelines blog post, this should look very familiar. Finally, we're going to loop until the channel is closed. And if we get an error from any backend, we're going to bail out. So this is where we're choosing right now that this is, we turn the whole thing down on any error. You might want to do something different in a real streaming system. You might not want to just bail out on any one error, right? But this is just an example where, uh, of what we're doing in this system. For each result, we're going to send it along to the client. All right, so watch back end. Um, it's going to, again, act as a client to the back end, uh, start, the, start the stream on the back end, and then loop receiving from the back end and sending the result on the channel. Now, what I need to explain here are these selects. So each time we're sending on this channel, we're selecting on either that, se that send operation or the context dot done. And this is an important subtlety that, again, is explained in that pipelines blog post. The reason we have to do this is because as soon as that hand, the watch handler returns, right, um, it's no longer receiving from this channel. And that se the send will block indefinitely. Right? This will be hung over routine. Context gives us a way to resolve this because that's going to tear down. That's, this, channel's gonna, this done channel is going to be closed as soon as that handler returns. And it indicates to the entire tree of go routines you've got running on behalf of this handler, it's time to go. So it's your job to write this select, but you have this nice broadcast indication that it's time to do that. And that's it. GRPC, here's my thesis here, it extends the Go programming model over the network. This isn't NetChan, like we're not trying to give you a channel abstraction, but we're giving you a nice clean API that integrates, it gives you blocking operations, but a way to do asynchronous cancellation. And then you can wire it together with GoRoutines and channels in the way you normally would. So it moves smoothly with GoRoutines, channels, cancellation. And I think it's an excellent fit for building parallel distributed and streaming systems. There's a lot of stuff to read. Uh, here's the gRPC page. Protocol buffers, HTTP2 uh, that was implemented by Brad Fitzpatrick. Um, the trace package, the context package, and that pipelines post. Special thanks to uh, a few of my fellow Googlers and teammates. Um, there's a lot of contributors here, uh, calling out a few of the key ones here, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. We, we might be happy to take questions, but we don't have any time, unfortunately. <laughs> However, you will be around and at the bar afterwards, I imagine, upstairs. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> so thank you very much.